Uh, Catherine, you, can you hear me? Can hear you beautifully. Welcome. Okay, thanks. And your slides looked great as well. Thank you so much. Right. Welcome everybody to this critical engagement webinar series in which we discuss, debate and evaluate the ever-changing body of knowledge that is emerging as a consequence of the current COVID-19 pandemic. We welcome you to the series which probes pandemic innovations, responses and partnerships. I am Catherine Burns, a historian of health and medicine based at WITS, and I'm hosting today with the WITS team in the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care, with Health System Sciences and the Adler Museum of Medicine, a technical backup from the WITS Marketing Department. Our series has been inspired by the image, characteristics and survival story of the Cape Pangolin, whose close relatives are found across the globe. And this webinar series seeks to unpack the interconnectedness of health, humanities, environment and science through a lens of systems thinking. As we all are coming to appreciate, the COVID-19 pandemic reveals a tracery of interlinkages, simultaneous and persistent epidemics, protective lockdown defenses, they highlight both our strengths and our vulnerabilities in our societies, adaptability and nimbleness alongside the burden of inherited structures and divisions. In today's live discussion, titled The Human Face of Vaccine Trials, Biopolitics, Trust, Science and Communication, we take up the social and scientific challenges in systems and planning and around legitimacy, ethics and the public communication of science that are key to the two COVID-19 vaccine trials underway in Africa and to vaccine trials in general. These two trials are led by a team at WITS headed by Shabir Mahdi, Professor of Vaccinology, and he is here with us today. We are delighted to have him, as with the person joining him in the discussion, Associate Professor Dr. Marta Nunez. She works at the Vaccine Preventable Diseases Unit and in her own research focuses on respiratory diseases in children and the potential vaccination of pregnant women prophylactically. Their extensive publication records and biographies are available on our website, along with links to their extensive publications and more recent publications, and links to short videos and interviews, for example with Prof Mahdi in the build-up to the vaccine trials and in public communication around the trials in the last couple of weeks. We are now going to move over to his presentation. He will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes and has some slides. And then Martin Nunes, Associate Professor, will do the same. We will then open it for discussion to this webinar. Thank you very much. Over to you, Prof Mahdi. Prof. Mahdi, we're not hearing your voice. Oops, my apologies, Catherine. I was speaking to myself. So good afternoon uh, to all of the attendees. Uh, so it's a real pleasure for me to be invited to address you this afternoon. And what I'm going to do is really provide a high level overview in terms of where we are with COVID-19 vaccines, what to expect and when to expect for vaccines to become available and perhaps touch on some of the challenges that we face. 
Uh, but before doing that, I thought it would be useful just to reflect that the organism that we're dealing with, for intents and purposes, as most of us know, does not actually constitute the qualities or the criteria for a living organism. And the ability of the virus to propagate and to be able to eventually transmit between people largely depends on its success in terms of hijacking the host cell. And it's by hijacking the machinery of the host cell that this virus is able to eventually replicate, uh, cause illness in an individual, and obviously transmit between people. Now, the manner in which people recover from this virus uh, is largely because of the immune responses. And similarly so, the reason why some individuals end up with severe disease uh, is because of a dysregulation in terms of the immune response. But when we look at recovery, and we need to remember that close to 60% of individuals that are infected with this virus would be completely asymptomatic. And in fact, the majority of individuals that are symptomatic, they would only have mild symptoms. And the reason for that is because of the ability of our immune response to mount an immune response, an immune response to the virus. And as part of that immune response, there is what is known as uh, B cell immunity and T cell immunity. And this is important from the perspective of vaccine development, because what we're trying to do through vaccination is to try to induce a similar sort of an immune response that is usually elicited through natural infection, but to be able to try to elicit that immune response in a much more predictable fashion. And the reason why that's important is that the learnings over the past few months in terms of naturally induced immunity, at least when it comes to antibody responses, is that the majority of individuals that end up with asymptomatic illness or mild infection will end up having a less robust immune response. That doesn't necessarily mean they might not be protected in the long term because they do mount T cell immunity, which might be persistent for at least two to three years based on experience with other common cold coronaviruses. But the antibody that's elicited usually wanes fairly rapidly uh, after natural infection and especially in individuals that have mild uh, to asymptomatic illness. So what we're trying to achieve with COVID-19 vaccines so without any reservation is simply unprecedented. Uh, we're trying to achieve what is usually, what usually takes about a 10 and a half year period in terms of vaccine development. As you can see, the vaccine from the 1960s, which uh, took the shortest time to, to be developed from entry into human trials was a mumps vaccine, which took about four years. And if we were to wait four years for COVID-19 vaccines, for all intents and purposes, the pandemic would have passed us because we most likely would have acquired immunity, uh, immunity through natural infection. And consequently, that would uh, possibly result in herd immunity, re resulting in a break in terms of the chain of transmission of the virus. So what is usually accomplished in an average of a 10 and a half year period, we're trying to condense that into literally a 10 and a half month period. Now, the agenda to develop a COVID-19 vaccine has really been phenomenal. Uh, over the now past nine months, since the first discovery of the virus to date, there's close to 200 vaccine candidates that have been developed, the majority of these still being in preclinical trials or still being in the laboratory. But we've got close on to about 35 vaccines that have now gone into human trials, including 10 vaccines that have gone into phase three studies. And included among those 10 vaccines that have gone into phase three studies are three vaccines that are currently being evaluated in South Africa. And the vaccines that are being evaluated in South Africa is a combination of what is known as subunit vaccines, as well as the viral vector-based vaccine. Now, in terms of the different constructs, what's also unprecedented is this real novel technology that's being used to develop COVID-19 vaccines. As an example, the nucleic acid vaccines, which are leading the field in the clinical development in the United States, is a technology that has never been used before to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. But that sort of technology is very amenable to a rapid production of uh, vaccine candidates once, there's, uh, once the sequence of the targeted pathogen is known. The viral vector-based vaccines, which is one of the two, which are two of the vaccines that are currently evaluated in South Africa, including the one from the University of Oxford and the J&J vaccine, again, a relatively new technology which has only been used once before, and that is over the past two years to develop a vaccine against Ebola. Beyond that, viral vector-based vector vaccines have simply not been used. 
The subunitase vaccines, it's a much more traditional approach. And I'm going to touch a bit br briefly on this one of the subunit vaccines, which is a Novavax vaccine, which in my mind probably is one of the most promising candidate, candidates. And I'll show you the reason for that. So as I mentioned, when looking at as vaccines, what we're really trying to do is elicit an immune response, but an immune response that is somewhat more predictable than it in, than is induced through natural infection. The durability of this immune response is pretty much unknown, and that's the reason why these studies need to be conducted and why there needs to be long-term follow-up of the participants to see whether there's immunity that persists beyond a few months and that's la lasting for at least two to, three, two to three years. Many vaccines that are given perhaps could actually induce uh, immunity that could be la long lasting for as long as 15 years. So wh where do we stand? Uh, so I, like I mentioned, I'm going to discuss specifically the one vaccine that is currently in, uh, in development or in evaluate, being evaluated in South Africa, and that is a Novavax nanoparticle subunit uh, vaccine. And what this basically shows is the immune responses after a second dose of the vaccine uh, in terms of the neutralizing antibody, the ability of the antibody to kill off the virus. And that is compared to, on, compared to on your left hand side, the immune responses that are elicited followed, following natural infection, uh, measured in convalescent sera of individuals that they have recovered. And as you can see, when looking at neutralizing antibody in the region of about 4,000 units uh, induced by vaccination, in the schedule that is currently being evaluated in the clinical trials, that falls short of the immune response that's induced in individuals with severe COVID-19 infection, but higher than that which is induced in individuals with mild or asymptomatic infection. So there's a number of studies that have now been done with the different vaccine candidates that have gone into phase three, looking at immune responses. But what do we want for a vaccine to be able to achieve? And that's one of two options. Uh, so these are studies that were done with a Novavax vaccine candidate in macaques, and basically what it looks like, what it looks at is the immune responses in the macaques on your left hand side. As you can see, it elicits robust immune responses after two doses of vaccine, and then when looking at intratracheal as well as as well as intranasal challenge with the virus in those macaques that have been inoculated or vaccinated, we find that this particular vaccine actually protects against infection both in the lung as well as in the upper airway. And the protection of infection both in the lung in the, and the upper airway is something that all of the vaccines would really aspire to. So a vaccine that only protects against infection in the lung will have less public health value in terms of being able to contain the spread of the virus compared to a vaccine that actually impacts on infection in the upper airways and reduces the infectiousness of those individuals that are, uh, that are exposed to the virus. So as I mentioned, there are 10 vaccines that are currently in phase three trials. And in all likelihood, at, by the end of this year, we would have results from at least two or three of, two or three of those uh, 10 vaccine candidates in terms of the efficacy, as well as in terms of the safety. And even if two or three candidates are shown to be efficacious, uh, that does not necessarily mean that low middle income countries in particular are going to gain access to the vaccine anytime soon. The unfortunate reality that has emerged over the past few months is one of vaccine nationalism, where governments that are representing about 13% of the world's population have already procured and entered into deals to procure at least 51% of the initial supply of COVID-19 vaccines that will be available. Now, unfortunately, this sort of vaccine nationalism lends itself to a scenario that is not very unfamiliar to us, in that access to vaccine for low middle income countries is largely going to be delayed. An experience from 2009 with a swine flu pandemic as an example, resulted in South Africa being the only country on the African continent to eventually gain access to the vaccine that was specifically developed for swine flu. But even then, South Africa only gained access to that particular vaccine after the pandemic that actually been declared to be over. And unfortunately, unless something changes, we're pretty much going to be ending up in the same sort of a boat where there's going to be a lag in terms of the introduction of these vaccines. And in all likelihood, the vaccines might end up coming to the country at a time when the virus has inflicted most of its uh, morbidity and mortality. 
Now, why do we find ourselves in this particular situation? And partly it's a failing not on the part of government necessarily, but also on the part of the private sector, also a failing on the part of academia. So in 2016, after the experience with the swine flu pandemic, the African governments came together and they made a strong commitment to promoting and investing in regional capacity for the development and production of vaccines. And that was in 2016. This is a publication from 2011, which indicated what was the capacity and what capacity existed on the African continent to manufacture influenza vaccines. And in 2006, there were no countries on the African continent that were able to manufacture influenza vaccine. In the year 2020, there are still no countries on the African continent that are able to manufacture influenza vaccine despite the experience from 2009 raising the alarm that unless countries are able to engage in, in vaccine manufacture, they at risk of being left behind when faced with future pandemics as we're being faced with currently. So it goes beyond influenza vaccine. In fact, other than for a small amount of yellow fever vaccine that's uh, manufactured in Senegal, uh, there's absolutely no other country on the continent, including South Africa, that has got any sort of meaningful vaccine manufacturing capability. In South Africa, we have a company in the Western Cape known as BioVac that has been in existence for about 25 years. And to date, they are unable to actually manufacture a vaccine from scratch. They have a facility which is able to do what we call fill and finish, which is sort of the end tail, which is a complex process, but simply doesn't lend itself in terms of ensuring that South Africa has got access to vaccines when it is required at an early stage. And the reality that we face as well is that this is not something that can be redressed in a period of the next 10 and a half months or the period of the next two years or 25 months, uh, because manufacturing vaccine is a fairly complex process and it takes years uh, to set up facilities that are able to actually manufacture vaccine. And again, this can only be done in partnership with academia who often are the source in terms of the discovery of the vaccine candidates. So where we, what we face currently in South Africa is despite being involved pretty much at the cold phase in terms of the evaluation of COVID-19 vaccines, the ability of the country to actually access the vaccines at the relatively early stage once these vaccines have been manufactured and shown to be efficacious is unfortunately somewhat bleak, uh, the outlook. And beyond that, we also likely to experience challenges when it comes to actual immunization of adults, because in a country such as South Africa, where there's a very low uptake of vaccines, such as seasonal influenza vaccine, there isn't any platform that can be leveraged on to expeditiously roll out COVID-19 vaccines. In addition to which, even if vaccines do become available to a country such as South Africa, in all likelihood, there is going to be a very limited supply of vaccine that will be made available in the first uh, two quarters of next year, resulting in us needing to undertake some level of prioritization as to which groups tend to benefit the greatest from being vaccinated. Last but not least, I think because of all of the focus around COVID-19, as many of you might be aware, there's a huge amount of skepticism and misinformation that surrounds vaccines. And in fact, a recent uh, survey in South Africa indicated that only two thirds, which is in fact greater what, than what it is in the United States, where it's just over 50% of adults indicated that should a vaccine become available against COVID-19, that they would actually agree to be vaccinated. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll hand over to Martha. Thank you so much for that. And Marta will put up her slides now. There'll be very rich questions coming from that presentation, I'm sure. Over to you, Marta. And hello, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, the invitation. Uh, let me put up my slides. This computer. So, thank you, Shabir, for the introduction um, of the topic. And uh, yeah, like Catherine said, I hope it will be a rich discussion uh, afterwards. So, I just want to confirm that you can see my slides and you can hear me properly. All good. Yes, we can. Good. So just to recap on the main points that uh, Shabir mentioned and that 
I'll, uh, I'll deal with some of them on my, on my intervention. So we really seen unprecedented investments on glo and global collaboration in research and development in this field of COVID and specific on COVID vaccines. And this hopefully will bring um, a vaccine to be uh, used for uh, public usage very soon. Just to give you that the phase, the first phase one trial from the Moderna um, company that was a collaboration with the, with the NIH started in March uh, 2020. This was really just three months after the first case of SARS-CoV-2 was uh, detected. So these are, are really exciting times for us that work in the field of, uh, of vaccines and infectious uh, disease. Many of vaccines that are being developed by entities that never brought a vaccine to the market or like Shibir said, are using technologies that never resulted really in other uh, vaccines. So it's really, really a, um, a field to, uh, to watch very closely and from where we can, we can learn even for future, uh, for future diseases. It is however expected that by manufacturing and the scalability issues coupled with, uh, uh, with unprecedented demand, will pose substantial hurdles to achieve immediate access to vaccines to all of them who need them globally. And like Chibi mentioned in his intervention, vaccine nationalism is a problem that, uh, uh, that we face. And once a safe and effective COVID vaccine becomes available, the world will, little, will really be confronted with great challenges of ensuring equitable access and fair allocation among the countries. And this is not only for, for vaccines, but also other interventions for COVID. So I want to introduce, um, it's really a, a groundbreaking global collaboration that uh, has different partners. And uh, it's called the Access to COVID Vaccine Tools, the ACT Accelerator, and uh, is really Different partners got aligned in this uh, in this partnership, like the WHO, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation (CEPI) for short, Gavi, that is the Vaccine Alliance that really brings uh, vaccines to um, the poor countries and uh, finances their, their vaccines and their health systems, the Global Fund, Unit Aid, Global. Welcome Trust and other multiple uh, private uh, partners and other stakeholders. So these partners really got together to try to get uh, uh, equitable access to vaccines, therapeutics, and, uh, uh, and diagnostics. And also as there is a, a cross-cutting um, health system connector because even for all these interventions, we will need, for example, supply the products to the community. We will need um, um, cold chain supplies and these are really cross-cutting across the uh, three pillars of these um, of of this strategy, the ACT uh, accelerator. So there are really great hopes that uh, this type of uh, collaboration and this, like, this type of different partners coming together will really um, bring the interventions globally at the same time for all uh, the different countries. So I'm just going to spend a bit more time on the vaccines pillar. So it's called the COVAX facility. So for short for COVID-19 Vaccine Global Access Facility. And this was really established to accelerate equitable access of appropriate, safe, and efficacious uh, vaccine. So this vaccine pillar is mostly has made three partners. So CEPI, that I, like I said, is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Innovation. And it's really an organization that is putting a lot of work and a lot of effort in uh, innovative uh, vaccines for uh, epidemics to control uh, new, uh, new epidemics. Then the, um, uh, the WHO is also uh, involved and is really trying to bring forward um, documents that will establish 
how the vaccines will be uh, allocated between the different countries, and then Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, to, um, responsible for the procurement and the delivery of, uh, uh, of the different uh, vaccines. So this COVAX facility, the aims of this, vac of this uh, facility are really to develop a large and diverse portfolio of uh, COVID-19 candidates, to have available and in enough supply the best vaccine for, uh, for high priority populations globally, so for all countries uh, will have access to the vaccines at the same time, to deliver at least 2 billion doses of the approved vac vaccines by the end of 2021, and hopefully this will end the acute phase of the pandemic by the end of uh, uh, next year. So the COVAX um, facility has really got functions like an insurance policy for most of the countries. So when the countries decide to participate in the, uh, in the facility, they will have a range of different vaccines that they can select uh, for. And um, so they will not only be uh, available the vaccines that the country had put uh, forward on on its own, and will really have access to the uh, to the to the pool of uh, vaccines that uh, are available through uh, the facility. So the COVAX facility is really envisioned as a global access mechanism with linkage across areas of research, development, and manufacture of vaccines, which aims to ensure the development and delivery of the approved vaccines for all countries at the same uh, time. So CEPI is really leading the, um, the vaccine research and development work, which aims to develop at least three uh, safe and effective vaccines, which can be made available to the participant economies. Currently, CEPI um, supports nine vaccine candidates, and eight of them are uh, currently on uh, in vaccine uh, in, in uh, advanced vaccine trials. Um, inside of the COVAX facility, there is a, finance, a financing tool called the Advanced Market Commitment Option. This is really put forward by uh, Gavi that uh, has been using this type of financial tools for other vaccines. And the primary focus of this um, uh, financial tool is really to ensure that 92 middle and lower income countries that cannot afford to pay for COVID-19 vaccines themselves get equal access of the vaccines as the higher and self-financing uh, countries all at the same time. Then this financing tool, the COVAX AMC, uh, has been established to raise fundings to enable Gavi to purchase the doses of the vaccine through uh, for, um, through funding from the eligible uh, countries and then it, they will be private donors or concessionals from uh, multilateral development banks that uh, will uh, be able to um, support them, the vaccines for the poor uh, countries. So the COVAX facility really serves uh, uh, at the same time as a pooling mechanism, so uh, to attract funding that then it will be distributed to, uh, to other countries and as a pushing financing mechanisms, so it finances at risk investment for R&D and manufacturing capacity for uh, different uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies. Um, but then, of course, if we have a, a, a vaccine, this it, it will need to be approved by WHO, by the Strategic Advisory Group of, uh, uh, of the WHO, and it really depending on, on the profile of the vaccine, on the profile of the different countries, probably different countries will need to choose among the different uh, uh, candidates that are available. So right now, and this, I, I just checked the numbers yesterday because the numbers are always changing, of, are always increasing on the amount of uh, uh, countries that are part of, of the facility. So as uh, of um, 9 of October, China joined the group of the self-financing self economies. So right now there are 171 self-financing economies that uh, sign up for uh, the COVAX uh, facility. And then there are the 92 lower uh, income uh, economies that will be eligible for the financial support through the COVAX uh, advanced market uh, commitment. So it 
like I said, this number is really increasing. So the USA has came forward and said that does not want to participate in this type of, um, uh, of initiative. Um, but so once we have vaccines that are, uh, are approved, um, hopefully all the countries will have access to it. However, like I said, probably there are not enough to vaccinate everybody in all the countries. So we do need to have an allocation formula and uh, WHO estimates that an allocation of those is equal to about 20% of the country's population should be enough to vaccinate people at the highest priority. In the initial phases, however, when doses are expected to be in short supply, countries will require doses in trenches until they have enough to vaccinate we expect at least 3% of their population. And then from there, they will escalate to uh, vaccinate other high risk uh, uh, adults. And really the, the target population that um, uh, all the countries or most countries are really uh, selecting will be probably frontline workers and uh, healthcare workers that care for, um, for the patients with uh, with COVID. So I think this is really a great uh, initiative. We have great hope that uh, the, um, the COVAX facility will, will at least ensure and will make a big effort for a lot of candidates, uh, uh, vaccine candidates to uh, go to final um, approval stages and that uh, all countries will have equally access to the vaccines at the same uh, time. So just to start the discussion, we put together a couple of discussion points and really we believe that should be no more silos. Global collaboration should really drive vaccine development at this time and uh, for the future. However, each company at the, at the moment, each pharmaceutical company is, re is running its own trials, comparing each candidate to a placebo. So. Could we also change that? Could, for example, we use a master uh, protocol where different trials run at the same time using only one placebo arm? And this was really an idea that uh, the WHO put forward with the solidarity vaccine trial that uh, at least is a smaller one is starting uh, um, soon. Then the trial uh, endpoints. So currently uh, the, um, the phase three vaccine trials are looking for COVID disease, not really COVID severe disease. So should we, how, how, what is the relevance really for uh, these uh, endpoint of uh, mild disease? Like you mentioned, most vaccines currently are developed to induce preventive immunity, but probably not really sterilizing immunity. And something that we didn't touch upon, but uh, that um, has been put forward by the USA, uh, FDA and WHO that if a vaccine that is now uh, under study that uh, in a trial shows an efficacy of 50%, it will probably be uh, approved. But so what will happen in the future if new vaccines that are probably, that could be better than these will, um, will be developed? How can we compare these new better vaccines with a vaccine that has been already approved with a lower um, effect. Um, like I mentioned, it's great that a lot of countries are coming together to make a, a pool of, uh, um, uh, of buying vaccines at the same time and also contributing for uh, lower income countries to receive the vaccine. But as should be shown in his slides, countries are definitely pursuing bilateral deals with manufacturers and how we can really deal with that. And uh, last but not least, I think it will be really tragic if we end up having a really great vaccine, but then people do not get vaccinated because of vaccine hesitancy. And just I'm sure the audience is well aware that nobody is safe from COVID-19 until everybody is safe. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for our attention. and. Uh, we are ready for the discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for that, Marta. And I hope that you and Prof Marty don't mind uh, showing your faces so that the audience can get a sense of the, the faces behind these vaccine trials. Thank you so much. We've already got uh, three really interesting questions and we're hoping that more come in soon and I'm sure they will. I'll take them perhaps in, um, in order of their, uh, when they arrived. We'll take three and then we'll, we'll give a chance for people to put in more questions. An anonymous uh, viewer asks, I understand there's never been a vaccine for a coronavirus. Is this true? And if so, why should we think there will be a vaccine this time? The second question that comes in is directed to Prof Mahdi specifically. Why did you not negotiate upfront vaccine access for South Africans if these are successful? since South Africans are being enrolled into these vaccine trials and providing vaccine efficacy and safety information. And then Sophia Tembo asks a question that goes to the end of Marta's presentation, talking of vaccine acceptance. And of course, this was also touched on briefly by Shabir. She says, there's a lot of misleading information about vaccines, suggesting that the so-called vaccine is actually a snare for certain groups of people. How do you plan to deal with so much fear instilled in people concerning vaccines? So perhaps we'll ask Shabir to respond first and then you, Marta, and then we'll ask another three. Over to you. So thanks, Catherine. Uh, so uh, in terms of the need uh, why vaccines have not been developed for, for coronavirus, so there are what we call the common cold coronaviruses. And the reason why there hasn't been much activity around developing a vaccine against the common cold coronaviruses, essentially is that it's a very mild illness. And that's very unlikely to be a market uh, to develop a vaccine against an illness, which is generally self-limiting uh, and extremely mild. But there have been efforts in terms of developing uh, a, a vaccine against the MERS virus which is a coronavirus, as well as the SARS uh, coronavirus, which was in 2009. Now, the reason those vaccines never were never licensed is because those epidemics actually burnt itself out. So consequently, there wasn't a need for vaccines against MERS as well as SARS coronavirus, unlike SARS-CoV-2, which seems to have become much more entrenched and has obviously had a much greater impact and probably will have an ongoing impact in terms of morbidity and mortality. Hence the, the reason why we want to develop a vaccine against COVID-19, but why vaccines that were developed for SARS and MERS were never followed through into licensure. They stopped at phase one studies. So in terms of the issue of negotiating upfront with the manufacturers for South Africa to access vaccines, uh, I think what we need to unpack here is that firstly, uh, there's absolutely no rush on a part of pharmaceutical companies or any of the manufacturers to evaluate vaccines on the African continent. In fact, it's a contrary, where there's very little uh, interest on their part to come to Africa to do what, they, what can be done uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, and that is a reality. And that reality, unfortunately, is one which has in the past led to there being anything between a 10 to 20 year lag between the time when vaccines uh, become licensed in high income countries compared to when they become available in low middle income countries, including South Africa, against life threatening diseases. Because the research simply, the South Africa doesn't. Uh, form part of the research agenda in terms of the clinical development uh, for a number of reasons. Now, why have we not, why have we not negotiated upfront uh, with the University of Oxford vaccine as an example? The, decision, the collaboration with the University of Oxford preceded their agreement with AstraZeneca for AstraZeneca to go into the final development of the vaccine and you may manufacture. So the University of Oxford were not in a position uh, to make any sort of commitments to South Africa. And it was us that reached out to them to see whether they would be interested in terms of at least supplying us with vaccine for us to be able to assess how these vaccines work in our own context. In terms of the other vaccine study, fortunately we're in a much better situation. where as part of the grant agreement and that study is also being funded uh, jointly by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Novavax 
is part of the agreement between uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Novavax. If the Novavax vaccine is shown to be efficacious in South Africa, South Africa would be prioritized in terms of being able to access that particular vaccine from the Serum Institute of India. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has also given a grant to the Serum Institute of India and in agreement with Novavax, the Serum Institute for India will basically produce the same vaccine for the low middle income country uh, market. And South Africa would be able to actually gain access, at least for the Novavax vaccine for, for a percentage of its population through that sort of a mechanism. And that will be done at the price which probably is more affordable than what South Africa would be expected to pay through the COVAX facility, being an upper middle, upper middle uh, income country. Uh, let me give the next question to Martha. Thank you. So I think the next question was regarding vaccine hesitancy and because I can't sit in the chat uh, any longer and what we are doing regarding vaccine hesitancy. So vaccine hesitancy is not only for COVID vaccines, but has really been established for a lot of other vaccines, unfortunately. And it has been shown that the, the anti-vaccine groups are more active, for example, in social media and then uh, vaccine, then groups that are pro-vaccines and the scientists like us. So how can we change this? I think doing what we are doing today. So really engaging with the society, really putting a, um, information out uh, about the different vaccines, about the different platforms, about the the risks and the benefits of uh, of vaccines. But it's really a lot of misinformation uh, going on. On the weekend, someone sent me a video of saying that, for example, these new uh, platforms that are being used, so, um, the uh, RNA and DNA uh, vaccines, like we said, there are, there is really no vaccine that is widely use these uh, technologies. And people saying that, oh, the DNA it will uh, be integrated in the person's DNA and you'll have a tag and people can follow you wherever you go. It's really just to, to, to identify people and to follow people around. So, and this really misinformation, we need to, to fight it and uh, um, say that things are really just uh, uh, not uh, uh, not true. So I think the best the best way for that is for us to hold the um, information sessions uh, like these. I know that, for example, um, Google and Facebook are also putting a lot of um, uh, interventions against that, that when people go and uh, um, looks for uh, vaccines and the effects of vaccines, they really try to minimize the, um, the matches for anti-vaccine groups. So I think it's really in our hands to try to, to change that. Thank you. Thank you so much for those very full answers. We have three more questions um, and there are others coming up. The first one is from Leslie Swartz at Stellenbosch and he asks a multifaceted question that addresses some of these points. It probably goes to both of you. He thanks you for your presentation and he says he would appreciate a discussion about uh, on what basis will the rationing of the vaccine uh, emerge? Uh, what kind of rationing decision making uh, matrix is being used? And he links that also to the question of vaccine skepticism, which you've just been addressing, Marta. He says that he thinks it's better here than in the US, but um, I was doing some research myself <coughs> last night and found out that vaccine denialism is rather high in South Africa based on our ranking in a number of recent global surveys. And he then says, what should ethics and social scientists do to support your efforts and to anticipate and help with these difficult issues. He also asks if the two of you can tell us if there are these kind of consortiums of interdisciplinary people coming together to work on this. And of course, he's drawing on his experience and others in the HIV vaccine and the potential lessons that could be learned from that whole experience with a lot of interesting work being done in, the, in South Africa. So that's a very complex question from Leslie. And linked to that are two shorter but very interesting questions. One from Anya Bedeker. Why is the requirement of benefit sharing, especially with reference to the countries that have ratified the Nagoya Protocol not being applied? And then a question from Kezia Lewins, 
does South Africa at present qualify as one of the 92 low income economies or are we comparatively too wealthy? And does this mean that we're relying on government or activist groups to access the vaccines Marta spoke about? We'll take the next round of questions after this. And I think maybe Marta can begin and then we'll go back to Shabir, we'll switch around this time. Correct, sure, no, uh, no problem. So, so, the, so the first question about the, um, how the allocation of the vaccine was, uh, was made. So this is really work going on by uh, the WHO and uh, we need to balance the, the, vac the vaccine doses that uh, it will be available at a certain point and uh, the people in need. And the people in need was really we, they did different groups of uh, people that will will be in the highest priorities. And this will be, I think, like I mentioned, healthcare workers, and then people over uh, 60 years uh, of age, 65 years of age, and people with the uh, comorbidity. But to tell this is a work in progress. So, and I think once we know them, uh, how effective the vaccines are, this will need to be applied to each country depending on the specific epidemiology of the disease at that time in the, uh, in the country. So these are just broad numbers and global numbers that then probably will be applied to each country uh, specifically. Um, then regarding, yeah, again, vaccine hesitancy yeah, I think in South Africa is probably not as bad as in other countries like uh, the US and just to share with you some of the experience that we had in the clinical trial. The, the first day that we were recruiting for the um, Oxford uh, vaccine trial, there was a huge line of people lined up outside of the, of the vaccine uh, clinic to, to um, enroll into into the trial and so I think there is really a lot of um, um, willing from uh, from uh, the South African society to to participate actively in trials and uh, and I think the university is doing like I said a, a, great, a great job in really trying to um, to give the message to the to the broader uh, society so I think then regarding South Africa and uh, the availability of the vaccine, South Africa can uh, make, um, can purchase the, the, the vaccine through the, uh, the COVAX facility. And uh, this can be done through the, um, through the, 90, the, the 92 countries that are currently uh, eligible for, um, for the funding through the advanced market, market commitment. So um, I think from my side was that. Let me. Was there any other point, or should we? Do you want to go now? Yeah, so perhaps I'll start off with the last point. So, uh, uh, Kezia, in terms of South Africa, the expectation is a country such as South Africa, which mm -hmm. is classified as an upper middle income country, they would need to procure vaccine uh, from the COVAX facility rather than uh, get vaccines through donor support. And the way the COVAX facility is designed is that a country such as South Africa would be procuring vaccine at full cost in terms of what the COVAX facility would be able to procure it from, uh, from the manufacturers. So there are some issues because as we know, our economy is pretty much in the tethers and whether, South Africa, whether that would be the most competitive manner for us to be able to procure vaccine uh, is an issue that's being discussed. Uh, so going back to Leslie, uh, Leslie, I think what you raised is, is a really important question and it needs to be addressed right now. And the short answer is that I don't think there's been a sufficient investment and in thought in terms of engaging with social behavioral scientists to start engaging with communities and to lay the foundation for us not to run into roadblocks once we start rolling out vaccines. And the time period that we've got available to us probably is around about six months during which this needs to be done. And as part of that, as I alluded to in my presentation as well, it's also determining what is the best platform beyond uh, the issue of vaccine acceptability in communities, which we need uh, social behavioral scientists to engage with, what is the type of platform that would be most amenable for us being efficient, being able to efficiently roll out uh, the vaccines? 
Uh, in terms of uh, the Nagoya protocol, uh, the short answer is that it doesn't seem to apply. Uh, like we've mentioned, uh, there's a lot of vaccine nationalism, which has pretty much become entrenched. And I think we already experienced this right at the start of COVID, of the pandemic, where countries, as an example, that where, people, where face masks were being manufactured, uh, put a ban in terms of the export of those face masks. And uh, a country such as India, as an example, has already indicated. So for low middle income countries, the best opportunity to probably get vaccine is from Serum Institute of India, at least for the Novavax vaccine and the University of Oxford vaccine. But the Indian government has also been fairly uh, adamant that the initial supply of vaccine that's developed, manufactured in India is not going to be exported, but rather it's going to be Indians, it's going to be productized for use in India. So we do face challenges in terms of when we're going to be able to gain access to vaccine. And then I'm just going to go to the other question with Lewell uh, asked in terms of uh, with a decline of the number of new cases in South Africa, I assume, uh, what challenge does it pose to vaccine trials? So it does pose a challenge. It doesn't pose a challenge so far as getting volunteers. As Martha mentioned, we're not having any shortage of volunteers. Uh, but the challenge that it poses is that for you to be able to address the question as to whether the vaccine protects against COVID-19 or not, you need to unfortunately have a certain number of individuals end up developing COVID-19 to be able to see what is the difference between a vaccinated group and a placebo group. So what's going to probably result the impact of that on, in South Africa is that it will probably take us much longer to be able to get an answer to that question than were there ongoing heightened levels of virus transmission. So it doesn't mean that we won't be able to get an answer, but it's unlikely in a South African context where there's, really, where there's much less virus that's circulating currently that we would be able to get an answer to that question uh, by the end of this year. Thank you very much for those full answers. And of course, they open up uh, increasing numbers of questions. I've received some anonymous questions that are asking um, how we can, in your view, both of you, how we can actually facilitate a bridge between people that are social and behavioral thinkers, uh, especially people that had a lot of experience during um, various kinds of HIV vaccine trials and draw them into discussions, for example, across the university platforms how do we bring that up to speed and have the two of you got a couple of suggestions that you can throw out to this multidisciplinary audience, even as we also contemplate this and uh, bring our own responsibilities forward as well. Because the question, of course, asked by Sophie earlier is still lingering and both of you have addressed it. There is a huge ferment in the general uh, public in South Africa around the question of people as experiments, um, uh, the snaring in of people for particular purposes. And it's really, really important and crucial that we all work together on this now. So we're asking you perhaps an unfair question, both of you, since you come from the scientific and clinical space, what kind of bridges would you like to see being built right now? And have you got ideas about how we can do this and walk together on this um, across interdisciplinary divides? Yeah, so Kathleen, if you were to ask me to sort of highlight one of the deficiencies in terms of South Africa's response to COVID-19, uh, it would be that we weren't broad enough in terms of the, the role players that came to the table, that were brought to the table to strategize in terms of how South Africa should respond to the pandemic, uh, and especially in relation to the absence of social behavioral sciences in my mind. And I think what needs to happen is that this is something, so there is a ministerial advisory committee for COVID-19 vaccines. And I think as part of that, they do have social behavioral scientists that are involved. But at the same time, I think what needs to happen is that uh, different institutions need to basically bring together groups, be it under the School of Public Health or which, whichever other group where these sort of discussions are actually uh, engaged uh, in. Uh, so it's really for the scientific community as a whole, not just a medical scientist, but the scientific community as a whole to start coming together. And like I said, this needs to be done in the next few months before vaccines actually become available. Because if we don't do it now, 
we are going to run into those sort of roadblocks. Thank you so much. And Marta, would you like to make a comment there? Yeah, no, so I, I think it's really the same, the same thing, collaborating uh, and in a university like ours that we do have uh, basic science and social and behavioralist science and yeah, really take advantage of, uh, um, of, of these multiple uh, groups and um, come together with the, with the strategy to, um, to tackle this problem. Yeah. I, I well, really we don't, don't have a solution, but don't I have think a solution, yeah. that's all. Yeah. In some of the uh, pandemic webinars that are coming up over the next couple of weeks, we will ourselves also be trying to put together groups um, of speakers who have this in mind. And so hopefully they will be they will be listening to the podcast live today or the recording and the recordings are available on the website. But we wanted to end with one last question to the two of you. We titled this the human face of vaccine trials. And we've talked a lot about the general public, nationalism, uh, citizenries, uh, communities of people. But you two as clinical scientists um, working really hard in this, we wanted to ask each of you to take a moment and to tell us about what your workload is like at the moment and how you are uh, finding resilience within your teams and in within yourself as persons. We've looked at videos that both of you have been in and very few people are asking you how you personally are coping and how your teams are coping with this huge workload that you're facing at the moment. I know that you're probably not comfortable speaking about yourselves, but we'd really like to invite you to reflect on that because your capacities and your resilience as individuals within your families and within your own communities are also going to be key. So uh, Marta first and then Shabir, would you like to reflect on that for a minute or two, please? Um. Sure, Catherine, and thank you for, uh, for asking. So it has been very intense, uh, how many months now? Uh, seven, uh, uh, eight months. And, uh, and for us at the unit, we started very early working on, on, on COVID. So by mid-March, we, we, we were already um, uh, planning studies and, uh, and then we took a huge endeavor of uh, doing the testing for the entire um, Crisani Baraguana hospital. And that really, really put a lot of strain in our lives, in our laboratory, in our team. So, so the short answer is that I'm tired. I need a break. Uh, my whole team needs, uh, needs a break. So, but we can't uh, take it at, uh, at this time yet. So it was really, exciting times and uh, um, yeah so it was sometimes difficult to cope but mo mostly due to we were just tired and we are still uh, tired and uh, but um, yeah I have a, we need to try to balance the uh, personal life and uh, and work and it's been difficult at times during the last uh, uh, seven to eight months and uh, yeah so Thank you. Let's and hope Shab the vaccine arrives soon and we can all take a break. Shabir, any comments about that question, which I think is unexpected to you, perhaps? Yeah, so Catherine, I think in my, uh, I, in terms of my own uh, perspective on this, this has been the shortest seven months of my entire life. Uh, in terms of the pace with which things have happened, uh, they really, it's amazing that seven months have already passed to me. Uh, and it's really been a whirlwind. But as Marta mentioned, this, uh, what this did, at least in our research unit, where we've got about 350 staff members, is that overnight, it uh, almost changed the culture of work in the research unit, where usually we were a unit that operated Monday to Friday from 8 to 5. And overnight, the staff in the unit committed to working seven days a week. Uh, the laboratory worked from 6 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And it's only over the past few weeks that they've now gone back to work until seven o'clock in the evening rather than at 10 o'clock. So it certainly has been highly disruptive uh, in the personal lives of almost every person in the research unit that has been involved. And it has come at a cost. Uh, many of our staff, unfortunately, were infected close on to one out of every five staff members uh, that were working, especially on COVID, were infected with the virus. And obviously, it also has come at a cost in terms of their own uh, social and personal lives. And my greatest gratitude and admiration to the staff for their contribution to 
the activities of the unit. Thank you both for sharing those insights and those experiences. Uh, Leslie Schwartz and others have been posting in the question and answer section uh, a real sense of uh, wanting to come together with social and behavioral scientists and with humanities people. And we will take up that initiative. We'll be emailing everybody who joined today to see if people in those disciplines would like to come together uh, in a more formal way. Many of us are doing things uh, perhaps in a less joined up way and actually uh, let you know about about some of those thoughts in, in a week or two. So I ask everybody involved in today's webinar to look out for an email about that. And without further ado, we're gonna put up our closing slide, thanking you at the same time for really joining us, all of us in the webinar today. Next week, you might be very interested that we're going back into the past, but we're going into the past in order to look forward. We've got uh, two outstanding historians joining us, Dr. Glenn Wilber, who's at the University of Pretoria History Department, who's worked on epidemics and pandemics across the South African Zimbabwean border and has done comparative continental work on polio, on HIV, on the influenza epidemic. And his former mentor, Professor Emeritus at UCT, Howard Phillips, who has done the most outstanding work on the history of epidemics in South Africa. I'm sure many of you know that he has published more than, I think, four major books and several smaller books for the more general public, but they're also very influential and important. And there's been a reissue, in fact, in the last 12 months of his book on the history of pandemics in South Africa uh, by Jakarta Press. So the two of them are going to be speaking and our panelists next week who will be holding the discussion is a doctoral student at WITS in uh, an interdisciplinary field. Uh, her name is Sinatemba Makanya, and she, she is also a traditional healer and comes from a, psych a clinical psychology background, and she will be hosting this discussion, and I think it will be rich and fascinating. So if we could please have the final slide up as we bid you all farewell. The podcast will go up very soon. And we thank you all for your attention here today. And particularly to Professor Shabir Mahdi and Professor Martin, Marta Nunez. Uh, Shabir Mahdi also has another huge role that he will be facing in the coming weeks and months. And he has our full support for that. He will be taking up the deanship of the Faculty of Health Sciences at WITS. We wish him all the best. And we know Professor Marta Nunez and her team will be continuing to support that work over at Chris Hani Baragwanath. Thank you, everybody for joining today and we hope to see you next week again. Cheers.
Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I think it's just the four of us here. Um, Richard, uh, were you uh, happy about how that all worked out? Just hold on, Catherine. Catherine. Just hold on. Let me stop sharing.